Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the IRT. My name is Richard Roberts. I'm the resident dramaturg at the theater. Thank you so much for joining us for our seminar conversation panel on Tuesdays with Maury by Jeffrey Hatcher and Mitch Album, based on, of course, the very famous book by Mitch Album. Uh, we did this play once before many years ago, and now we're doing it again. And uh, it started streaming this last Monday and continues streaming through February 21st. So if you haven't had the chance to see it yet, I hope you'll see it soon. Meanwhile, tonight we have an exciting live panel discussion event. Our guests are Dr. Robert Pascuzzi, who is the Professor Emeritus of Neurology at IU School of Medicine and Director of IU Health's ALS program. We have Natalie Sutton, Chapter Executive at the Alzheimer's Association, the Greater Indiana Chapter. And we have Mandela Moyo, Director of Community Engagement at AARP Indiana. Welcome, all three of you. Thanks for joining us. Um, let's start off by having each of you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do. Why don't we start with you, Dr. Pascuzzi? Well, thanks. Uh, pleasure to be here and uh, appreciate the invitation. Uh, it's great. So I'm a neurologist and uh, grew up in Indiana. The uh, uh, training was out in Virginia, but I've uh, been here working at IU. Uh, for 35 years or more in neurology. And uh, so my affiliations, if you will, of the School of Medicine, and then uh, you already mentioned IU Health, the clinical service component. And amongst the uh, areas of interest uh, it would be ALS, which um, is the topic here. And uh, we have um, a large uh, and productive and important ALS program that uh, involves uh, helping diagnose patients. We have a team of people that do this, uh, a number of neurologists and others. Then we manage patients in a large multidisciplinary clinic that's sponsored by the ALS Association. It's one of the national centers of excellence for management. And then we conduct uh, research, uh, including a clinical trials research and basic research uh, in order to find out what causes ALS and figure out some uh, more optimal way to treat it long term. So that's my role here. Could you, for those of us who are perhaps not uh, as up on our medical terminology as we could, should be, could you give us the brief definition of what ALS is and what it does? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, first of all, it has multiple names and these are all synonymous. So most people, um, refer to this as Lou Gehrig's disease because he had this disease. Uh, but the disease was actually described uh, 50 years before he uh, was diagnosed by a famous neurologist from France called Charcot. And in Europe, it's called Charcot's disease. Um, in most of the world, it's called motor neuron disease because the motor nerves in the brain and spinal cord are the nerves that gradually, slowly, uh, age and fail prematurely. It's like premature aging, uh, where these just motor nerves that control movement uh, quit working. Uh, and then um, much of the world refers to it as ALS, which is an abbreviation for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Amyotrophic is the uh, description of lower motor nerves that go from the spinal cord to the muscle. And when those malfunction, the muscles shrink up gradually. Uh, the muscles get weak and floppy, and the patients have twitches. And then the lateral sclerosis refers to another set of motor nerves that begin up in the brain. So when you want to make any part of the body move, you have to think that thought and activate a nerve in the thinking part of the brain called an upper motor nerve, which sends wires down in the spinal cord. And so if the upper motor nerves malfunction, the patients have stiffness, jumpy reflexes, slurred speech, they get tight, uh, spastic. Um, and uh, it affects the part of the spinal cord that runs out laterally uh, that gets scarred up. And, and that's our, uh, our reason for calling it sclerosis. So amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, motor neuron disease, and in some parts of the world, Charcot's disease. They all mean the same thing. It begins somewhere in the body, usually in a hand, sometimes in a foot, less often in the speech area. And, and it begins gradually. It's a slow, progressive, painless, creeping paralysis 
that usually uh, um, lasts two to five years on average. And when it gets into the breathing muscles, unless you're on a mechanical ventilator, like uh, Stephen Hawking for many years, then uh, survival is limited to those two to five years. Uh, and uh, it's slow, it's progressive, it's relentless. Some people have a steep slope and don't survive a year from the time it starts. Some people have a real slow form. So two to five years doesn't fit them. So uh, that may be 20% of people go longer than five or 10 years. Uh, so that's the condition. The cause is largely not known. There's about 5% of people where the cause is known because it's genetic and the genetic basis for it is known. But for 95% of people, they just get it. Uh, sort of like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease where there's a small group of people where the cause is known as genetic. But for all of these degenerative disorders of the brain and spine, the actual fundamental mechanism or cause isn't known. So why one person gets it and the other doesn't isn't clear. It affects one in 10,000 living people. So I think there's like 7 million people in Indiana. So there are 700 patients at any one point in time in Indiana with this condition. Wow. Wow. I wasn't familiar with the term motor neuron disease, but that makes perfect sense. That helps me. That seems a clear way to understand what it is. And of course, ALS is the disease that Maury of Tuesdays with Maury um, has. And so um, when you see the play, you will see the gradual progression of that disease through his body as the play goes along. We're not only talking about ALS tonight, we're talking about aging in general. And so we have Natalie Sutton here from Alzheimer's Association. Ms. Sutton, tell us what you do and what the association does. Well, thanks for having me tonight. I am the executive director for the Alzheimer's Association's Greater Indiana Chapter. And we are a national voluntary health association focused on Alzheimer's and all other dementia. Uh, Alzheimer's disease affects 5 million Americans. It is a progressive brain disease that is also fatal. And it is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, and of the top disease-related causes of death, it is the only one uh, for which there's no way to stop, slow, or prevent the disease. And so that makes it similar, uh, I think, to ALS. Um, and at the Alzheimer's Association, we focus on advancing scientific research uh, because we hope that one day we will be able to stop, slow, prevent, or cure the disease. Uh, and so we provide that hope uh, and advancement of research and scientific conversation around Alzheimer's and other dementia. Um, and we also, though, are providing care and support for uh, those who are affected by Alzheimer's and dementia, as well as their caregivers. Uh, this is a condition uh, that requires a lot of support from caregivers. Uh, and so we're there to help on that journey as people are going through it now. And then finally, we also uh, do focus on advocacy. So we advocate for our constituents with the federal and state government to ensure that public policy supports uh, the people who we're serving. Wonderful, thank you. I'm sure, obviously, this disease has been out around forever, but it's only become really prominent in the public eye in fairly recent years. Um, what did people call it before? They called it Alzheimer's disease. Well, uh, there were days when we called it uh, hardening of the arteries, uh, but it was actually, the disease was discovered, um, I believe, I may be wrong on my statistics here, but I believe a little over a hundred years ago wow. uh, by a scientist and, and a physician, uh, Dr. Alois Alzheimer's, in a younger patient. So uh, the oh, patient wow. in, whom that, in whom the disease was discovered was, I believe, 54. Um, and so it, that is actually what we would now refer to as younger onset Alzheimer's disease, uh, but that's how it was initially discovered. Um, I do think that you're right that uh, the, it has become more prominent uh, and um, you know, we hope that that is part of the work that we do at the Alzheimer's Association too, making sure that people are aware of uh, what is normal and what is not normal as we age and, and what constitutes memory loss. And, um, and so uh, our organization, while many other voluntary health associations were founded, you know, 100 years ago or in the 1940s or 50s, our organization has only been around since 1980. Uh, wow. so 
is uh, were a little bit more recent. And I think in the in the way of scientific research as well, um, we're not as far along in understanding the disease uh, as as that we are with other you know uh, diseases where there are those treatments and preventions and uh, cures out there. Uh, but we're coming a long way, and there's a lot of hope in the research space right now at this time. Great, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Thank you, Mandela Moyo. You're with the American. No, not American. I don't even. I okay. I was just saying the name a minute ago, and now. Yeah. I'm having a little memory moment and I can't remember what AARP stands for. So I'll well, let you say it. Well, so it's a good thing. You don't, you don't have to remember it. It's AARP, um, AARP Indiana. Um, we, we did have abbreviate, abbreviations at one point, um, but <clears throat> we dropped that and, and we're just um, AARP, uh, mainly because um, you know, the, the folks that we represent started 50 uh, and not everybody at 50 has retired. And so our mission is to make sure we're committed to improving the lives um, of Hoosiers um, as they age. Um, and we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization um, that helps 50 plus folks um, have independence, achieve goals, and obviously live uh, better lives. And so I think Natalie talked a lot about advocacy. And I think that's, that's our strength um, is what are we doing to make sure that the public policy, both at the local, state, and federal level, supports uh, particularly our family caregivers, um, and then also folks who want to be able to age in place. Uh, and so, health, uh, home, and community-based services is something that's extremely important um, to us and to the work that we do uh, to ensuring that, just like in the play, uh, folks are able to to be at home and thrive at home. Um, and not have to go, if, if they can, uh, not have to go into uh, a facility or into care. Uh, and so really um, our goal as an association is to make sure that we all um, have the opportunity to age well. Um, and for vast majority of our members, they do want to age in place. And so what our communities um, from cities, states, and, 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 and sort of on a federal level doing to ensure that the quality of life of their 50 plus residents um, is improved and ensured that they are able to sort of live the best life that they can, um, regardless of their ability um, or kind of what they're facing in terms of challenges. And I think from the place perspective, you saw sort of the passion um, that the individual has for their end of life. And it's not just the sort of uh, the end for them, it was more of a beginning. And so I think that's really something that we wanted to make sure <clears throat> that our members and, and non-members alike are also sort of implementing into their caregiving journey, regardless of um, what diagnosis you have and ARP is, is there to be a resource for you. Wonderful, thank you. I confess I'm one of those people over 50 who has okay. resisted joining AARP because I'm not yes. retired. Richard, listen. Tell me the water, what I'm the missing water, out on. The, the water is is absolutely fine. Yes, I think for 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 many people the hesitation is is the same, uh, right? I'm 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 still I'm 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 I'm, I'm reaching fifty. Um, I don't feel old, and and we My say that's, that's great. <laughs> we say that's great. Um, I think we understand that you know, and I think that's where the ARP sort of the retirement piece um, was dropped from our name um, is that we understand that. Our uh, membership is not all sort of out of work. Um, and so what you're missing, obviously you have a great team of ARP Indiana staff that are advocating for on your behalf, both from things around quality of life, um, from everything from retirement uh, issues. So what are you, what, how are we helping you prepare for your retirement? Um, sort of quality of life, so transportation, housing, all of those pieces, what are we doing to make sure um, Indianapolis is a great place to age? Uh, and so those are things that we do. Um, and then obviously from a caregiving perspective and what we're doing um, from that end is ensuring that for those of us who have to sort of start this journey, ARP is there for you to be a, to be a resource uh, to tap in and help you sort of um, map out the, the journey, whether you're caring for a loved one or um, you're the one that's in care. Uh, and so we're doing all of those things for folks regardless of their age. Um, whether or not you join ARP doesn't really matter to me. The work will continue to, to do. I would love to have you as a member and count you in with our other 820,000 members across the Hoosier State. But peer uh, pressure. No, no, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Um, but I think the 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 
the bigger the bigger thing is is having opportunities like this to share our message. And then, you know, from a discount perspective, um, this is something that, you know, we love to present to our members too, the opportunity to experience, uh, to have member experiences. We would have loved to be um, in the theater with, with everybody, but we all know kind of what's happening around us. Uh, but then how can we then present those opportunities to our members who can't get out or want to stay at home and enjoy um, Tuesdays with more? Great, thank you very much. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're streaming live on Facebook right now. I should have also mentioned that we are recording this pro program so that uh, people can watch it later on. Uh, you can find that on the IRT website. And I wanna say to our listeners, if you have any questions you wanna ask tonight, please use that little Q and A button at the bottom of the screen and put in your questions and we will get to them later on in our conversation. Um, let me ask you folks, we are here to talk about Tuesdays with Maury. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts about it? What are your thoughts about the book, about the play, about the, uh, the way it depicts the aging process, particularly from the point of view of your uh, specialty? Let's start with you, Dr. Pascuzzi. Dr. Pascuzzi actually worked with our actor, Henry Warnitz, on his, uh, to create an accurate depiction of the disease on stage. What was that process like? The process was, uh, I thought, uh, enlightening. I enjoyed it. Um, and for reasons that um, um, it, it went beyond just getting some information about what the patients look like so that the actors can uh, basically have a, an accurate portrayal of uh, what the patients do, how they how they function, uh, I, and so that's that's kind of the nuts and bolts, which I thought was interesting, and I'm happy to you know explain a little bit about what the disease does and how it affects people in a way that may help um, uh, actors uh, be able to portray adequately. But the part that I thought was great was that uh, it seemed to me that the 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 team wanted to to know more than just how to mimic what happens to the patients. The team wanted to understand what is this disease and what's it do to you and what's it do to other people? And even discussions around questions about what happens at the end? What is death like in this? Is it, and, the, and I, I had the sense that this team of non-doctors, I spend my whole day around doctors, okay? So, uh, but, the, the, these were actors and they, um, they wanna know um, about what is this? What's the meaning behind a disease like this and what it does to people? Almost sort of an existential uh, uh, appreciation for what it is. Well, there's so, gotta be a whole mental process as well as the physical process of right. dealing with it. Right, sort of the emotional, the psychological, the existential challenges that the patients have, that the caregivers have, which in some ways are even more challenging. These are, these are similar discussions uh, with Natalie and her team in Alzheimer's disease, uh, as well as our colleagues that deal with Parkinson's disease, these slow progressive chronic disorders that require a lot of attention that affect people in many different ways. So um, I thought the process of working with the team was, um, really interesting and actually I was amazed that the team wanted to know more than just how do I look like a patient with ALS? How do I help a patient get up with ALS? They wanna know what is the disease? What do we know about this? I felt like some people coming at this from a different point of view might have some insights about what we should be doing for these patients and their families. Oh, that's great, that's great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sutton. Yeah, well, um, I want to thank you so much for, you know, doing the play and for doing it now. Um, I enjoyed the live theater virtually, but also, um, you know, how can you lo not love Maury? And uh, I, I tapped into something a little bit different too, which was just his uh, thirst for connection and human connection and how we all need that right now. So I felt like it was a really great time uh, for you to be sharing this pr particular production um, yeah. 
as we're all, and, and especially our aging adults uh, in many cases uh, need connection right now. And, and we're looking for ways to connect with each other uh, that are safe at this time. Uh, but one of the things, one of my takeaways, um, one of the questions that I get so often in the community, uh, we, we really promote early detection, accurate and early diagnosis. And so often people ask, you know, why would I want to know if I have Alzheimer's disease, if there's no, if you're telling me that there's no treatment and there's no cure and, uh, you know, there's nothing you can do. And, and typically, historically, my answer is, well, there are things you can do. You know, you can, you can make decisions while you still have the ability to make decisions. You can uh, enjoy that time with your family. But I think uh, watching Maury, my perspective was a little bit different, which is just that you can live every moment that you have, every day that you are yourself, you can choose uh, to be living to the fullest and to, to be living like it's your last. And uh, so I, I walked away with a little bit of a different perspective on that question that I hear so often uh, from community members. That's great, thank you, thank you. Mr. Mayo. Yeah, no, so uh, I think Natalie brought up a, a really great point. I, I think for, for, for me, and I think even from the resources that ARP has, right, we're always sort of thinking about, okay, what can you do to plan, right? So you, now you have this idea, you have this um, diagnosis, you know, you kind of know what's happening. And then, so what do you need to, what things need to be in place? And so our caregiver resource guide is sort of built around that. But then a lot of times we don't talk about, hey, you can still live life to the fullest. Now you may have to put a little couple of guardrails here and there for it, but I think for the most part, um, and I think this is what the play was trying to portray and, and is that we have an opportunity to live life differently in spite or, you know, despite what's happening to us. And so both from, you know, him himself having to go through the disease, but also the person who was caring for him, you know, learned a great life lesson about how to handle both life and death. And I think we often have a, a grim, grim outlook on, on those pieces. Part of it, obviously none of us really have an idea of when, you know, things will happen to us or what will happen to us. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a lesson in sort of living every day to its fullest. And, and I think that's an amazing, amazing lesson to, to, to teach. Not only folks who are, um, are, have received, you know, some terrible diagnosis news, but for the folks who are caring for them, that if both of y'all have that same attitude that, hey, okay, this is, this is what's happening to us. This is not what's, that, this is not who we are. And so taking that approach is, is going to be really important for folks who are caregiving for a loved one or are about to enter into a caregiving journey, that it's going to be important that you both are sort of living your best life um, as you can, you know, counting, not counting the days, but counting sort of the memories and the time that you have together. That's, that's a great point you're making. One of the things that really occurred to me as I was watching the play was um, <clears throat> the idea that this disease is happening to Maury, but Mitch as his caregiver, it also goes through a huge life change during this process, taking care of him. And, I, and Mitch is only one person we see in the play. There's Maury's wife, there's Maury's hospice nurse, there's Maury's friends, there's Maury's students. And the, the literally millions of people who watched those interviews with him on Ted Koppel. So I think, you know, how much we all can learn from that process. And nowadays, in the midst of this disease that we are in now, it's a great time for us to think about what can we learn from this? because we can't get away from it. We have to live with it. We have to learn something. I, so I might add, uh, w when I read the book, which must have been, when was this? Like 30 years ago, the book came out? Uh, the book came out in 87, I think. I, yeah, so I read it because it was about a guy with ALS. And so that's sort of my professional interest. And so I thought it'd be a fun, fun book to read. The, um, but um, for me, getting through the book, um, the, the important takeaway point wasn't about the ALS, just because I see that, every, I see ALS, and so I know what happens. But for me, the, the eye-opening part was the Mitch Album character, um, the author, uh, the transformation that was stated, um, and realizing that uh, life 
the is not about being rich and famous and traveling all over the world and having you know great awards and accolades and making all the money and driving the fancy cars which was the trajectory Mitch album was on it's about the human connection and being human i would say that the the the, the money and all that that's kind of human nature to have some uh, interest in 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 trying to achieve that but the real human part about realizing what's important with being a human being is what Mitch Albom, I think, uh, acquired from his interaction with his old professor. Yeah, and it really turned his life around. Like you said, he was very focused on his career as a sports writer. Uh, at one point in the play, he says he has five different bosses, five different companies he's working for as a sports writer, and he's constantly on the phone. And then we all know from after his experience with Maury, he's, he's still a sports writer. He's still a, a radio television personality, but he also, he's written half a dozen books about this, these human connection ideas. And so he's really made a huge change in his life and career. And that's, that's a pretty uh, impressive argument for the power of, of how those human connections can really change us. Um, I have a question here. Um, nowadays with COVID, so many of our seniors are in nursing homes where we cannot, literally cannot interact with them. What thoughts do you guys have about what are the best things we can do for our loved ones and friends who are, who are in that situation? We're uh, recommending that people do anything and everything that's available to them. So um, I know, you know, if there is the ability to use technology to, um, you know, to talk with your loved one who might be in a long-term care facility. We're encouraging that. Um, really, I think, uh, and and we've done some some great programs with some of our long-term care ombudsmen in the state, but um, making sure that you can, you know, virtually and through the phone or uh, through virtual settings, get to know your loved one's caregivers and um, and make sure again that, you know, you're keeping the routine as, as simple as possible. It's a very hard situation. And, you know, of course, uh, infection control in our long-term care communities has uh, also caused a lot of limitations for the staff and uh, the just the demands on those professional caregivers. Um, but, you know, there have been so many inspiring photos of window visits and, you know, people who maybe have never used technology but are talking to their loved ones virtually. And, and you know, of course, we recognize, too, that that can be hard, especially depending on the diagnosis. Um, some of our individuals with dementia have a hard time with a, a video connection and not understanding, you know, what's happening and where their loved one is. And, um, and so, you know, we're also seeing a lot of people really rely on the phone. And, um, but I would say um, anything and everything that we can do to stay in touch and provide that form of connection, even though it's limited and it's not all that we want. Um, you know, I think both people on both sides, both the, uh, the family caregivers and the individuals who are living in long-term care uh, need that we need we need anything so be as creative as possible um for sure <laughs> i love what you said about getting to know the caregivers uh that's so important that connection as well uh you two other gentlemen have thoughts you want to add uh, i i think just from our perspective we would we would echo sort of what what natalie uh, mentioned uh, about sort of from a virtual uh space um obviously um, making sure you're the best advocate for your family member who is in care. Um, the building the relationship uh, with with the facility or, or or space where they are being cared for is important. And obviously, this is something that ARP Indiana has championed uh, or is currently championing both at the state house and on, on a federal level in in terms of um, how are we able to make sure facilities have the PPE um, and, and testing and, and all of those pieces in place so that we can sort of get to a, a point where folks can go out and, and visit safely with, with their family members. And I think that connection piece is extremely important. Um, video chats and phone calls can only go so far, uh, but I think what we want 
to make sure folks understand is that, yeah, we're, there are folks like Natalie and myself, and I'm sure the doctor as well, who are fighting to make sure that folks can get back um, to seeing their loved ones as quickly and as, uh, as safely as, as possible. And, and ARP Indiana is one of those organizations as well. Those are really good points. Um, as uh, perhaps the oldest person on the panel who is an AARP member with many benefits, I, um, some of us aren't very good with technology. So you got to have, uh, you know, and you have to be able to see well, your fingers have to work. You have to, so, I, but I think it's, that's, that's one way to do it. The only other thing I would suggest is that since we're changing the way we experience our day and how we communicate and interact, I think that uh, as an old person, uh, thinking back to the old days where you write a letter or you write a poem or you draw something or make something, make some art, uh, be able to um, find something creative to then get to the person. I think that represents a lot and it's a different kind of communication than uh, the typical video and texting and all. So um, I think uh, there are many ways to do it. I like the notion of be creative and find some other way to interact and appreciate each other. That's a lovely idea. That's so great. Um, here's another question. Natalie, you talked about the fact that there's nothing you can do to prevent Alzheimer's. Um, I'm one of those people who does crossword puzzles every day, partially because I enjoy it and partially because they all say, this is a great thing to help stave off Alzheimer's. Is there any truth in that at all? I'm so glad you asked that question. And I should clarify, there is no way to pre prevent Alzheimer's, but yes. there are ways to reduce your risk of developing Alzheimer's or dementia. And um, so there's a lot of science happening. The Alzheimer's Association is actually leading a national clinical trial uh, to provide a clinical, a true clinical study on those various interventions and on kind of a multidisciplinary approach. So looking at nutrition as well as exercise, as well as um, you know mental stimulation and, and puzzles and social engagement and um, and we're really looking, you know, in this trial for what is the right combination to give you the best risk reduction. Uh, so we hope that there's a lot of exciting research, and, and certainly there have been uh, individual there have been studies on each of those individual components and um, and studies in other countries. So uh, the trial that we're running right now is called the U.S. Pointer Study. If anyone's interested in more information. Uh, but yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. There are ways to reduce your risk. Uh, and, and what we're learning as we advance the science is that um, heart health, uh, it, our brain health looks a lot like heart health or cardiovascular mm. health. Um, you know, but we still have a lot of work to do in that area as well, uh, though we certainly encourage those healthy brain activities for people. Wonderful. Thank you. In that same realm, Dr. Pascuzzi, what's What's the latest happenings in the realm of finding a cure for ALS? So a lot of work being done, number one. Number two, really smart people working on that issue. Uh, and um, a lot of the same theories are out there as apply to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's about cause and how to treat, how to slow down the disease, stop the disease. There's, there are a couple of FDA approved drugs uh, for treating uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS that uh, slow down the disease, but they don't slow it down much, just a little bit. Uh, so uh, there are 10 different strategies out there looking at different aspects of how the disease presents and how it progresses uh, with the idea of trying to stop it or more dramatically slow it down. There, I would say the most um, appealing uh, research currently comes out of that small group of people that have, a, have genetic forms of ALS where the genetic defect in their DNA is known, there are some um, techniques of uh, generating um, uh, antibodies and other um, uh, interference uh, uh, type of uh, agents that can be injected into patients and can seek out like a missile and uh, selectively uh, stop or block uh, those genes from producing unwanted proteins. 
So it's very, uh, they often talk in medicine about personalized medicine, where, where you, you have a, a treatment that's designed for your specific problem. So these are currently in clinical trials, and it turns out some of those genetic defects that are seen in the familial ALS patients, they actually found in patients that don't have a family history for ALS. So uh, success in this realm may actually spread over to others. So I think in all fairness, um, we have a lot of treatments that probably if they work, they're gonna work poorly. And we have some stuff going on that actually could work really well. Um, so I, I would say the, the, the menu of possibilities has never been more appealing than it is now for getting something that's useful. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I have a slightly um, less cheerful question, but it's something that I think it would be very useful to talk about. Someone is saying that um, they, they have heard more talk recently about the idea of assisted suicide for older people. Is that something that you folks deal with and how do you deal with that idea? I'm happy to comment on it. Uh, patients from time to time ask about it. It's not an overwhelming question. And in Indiana, uh, physician assisted death uh, is, uh, is not legal. There are some states where it is legal and the number of states is increasing. So it's, it's an important topic, particularly if somebody has a progressive degenerative disease that can't be fixed or reversed. Patients at some point, they often do shift from being in a place where their quality of life is good enough, it shifts where it gets to the point where their quality of life just isn't good and they don't have prospects for getting better. And uh, I think that in those patients, the goals shift from survival at all costs to comfort at all costs and let's make sure they're comfortable. And so in Indiana, like in a lot of states, there is uh, abundant uh, use of palliative care services and hospice services with a theme of emphasizing comfort. So all the big decisions are made on, is this gonna make the patient and their caregiver more comfortable? Uh, if so, then it's a logical thing to do as opposed to making decisions that are intended just to have people survive as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you, thank you. I have one last question. Um, can each of you give us one thing that we can do to make our aging loved ones lives better or to make our own aging years better and more vibrant and more worth grabbing every minute out of? Um, I think obviously from, from ARP's perspective um, is if you are in um, a caregiver or you're caring for someone, um, you know, that, that is in your care at home or in a facility, I think the biggest thing we want you to do as the family caregiver is to care for yourself, right? So find um, experiences that you enjoy. IRT has a great season uh, lined up. So if you wanna, you know, watch some plays, take walks. Um, we were talking backstage about sort of what folks have been doing during um, the pandemic in terms of taking drives and experiencing communities and, and the, the spaces around us as safely as possible. So yeah, it's, it's really going to be important for folks to be able to um, care for themselves and, and do what's important to make sure they feel recharged and, and rejuvenated as much as, they, as much as they can. I think those are great points, uh, Mandela, and we would certainly echo those points, especially for caregivers and making sure that you're practicing self-care. Um, but just, you know, kind of going back to the play and something that Mandela said earlier, uh, I, I kept thinking of the, there's a quote that is something along the lines of, you know, you can't control what's happening to you, but you can control how you how you address it and how you handle it and the choices you make. And uh, for me, I think, um, you know, seeing people age, I, I think there is a mindset and there are those people who choose, um, you know, I, I am going to squeeze everything I can out of this life. I'm going to, and, you know, Maury was certainly one of those people uh, just to the very last minute. And so for me, I, you know, just, observing the play, I, I think that that would be my, my takeaway as on aging. Great, thank you. 
those are really good comments. Um, so I'm going to have maybe you guys come to our clinic and help uh, discuss this with with people. I, I don't really have any brilliant answers. My, I mean, I think every day counts. I do think you have a limited number of days. I don't know what it is, but they're limited. So uh, take everyone and make it meaningful and special and have your friends and children and loved ones and patients do the same thing and appreciate instead of instead of we our patients are great because for the most part they have these problems they can't move things they can't speak well they can't they, so they have all sorts of challenges but instead of spending their day thinking about the things they can't do they try to focus on i'm going to focus on what i can do and be productive and happy and try to contribute something have meaningful meaning to their life uh and i think that's that's um that makes sense. And uh, you control what you can. Some things, some outcomes you can't control, but the effort you can control. So instead of making no effort to engage your friends and family and community, at least even in research in this disease, there's tremendous engagement by patients and families, patients who sign up to be part of clinical trials, testing new experimental therapies, unknown risks and uh, nobody knows it's gonna work. The people who step up to the plate and try to really contribute something to making this a better place is really inspirational. And uh, so those of us who don't have dementia yet or ALS or Parkinson's, um, I think it's a signal we're supposed to be active and do things that are gonna help those of us who will get it down the road. Wonderful. Thank you all three very much, so much for joining us this evening. It's been very interesting and enlightening. Thank you folks who are listening in for joining us. If you haven't seen it yet, see Tuesdays with Maury streaming at the IRT from now through February 21st. After that, we have a wonderful play coming up called Number Six, and then we'll be, we'll be doing Cyrano, and then we have two more shows that we're about to announce any minute now. So we have a full season of great shows for you. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today and have a great evening. Good night.